So I said we're not going to come anywhere near the peak throughput of the machine. However, we are coming near the peak bandwidth of the machine. If you measure the effective gigabyte per second bandwidth utilization of these kernels, it looks pretty good. In fact, if you were paying attention, you noticed that I said the peak <laughs> bandwidth is 144, and that, that column at the right is actually close to 160. I'm calling it effective bandwidth because the way this is measured is to take the number of words that we know we transfer and divide by the running time. So you can exceed theoretical peak because of caching effects. So this line here where we do, in fact, exceed the, the theoretical peak is a case where you know, the cache has allowed us to get above theoretical DRAM bandwidth. But fundamentally, as I said before, success means a high percentage of peak bandwidth. And in all of these cases on this slide, you are getting a high percentage of peak. Northwestern has a question. Uh, how big are these uh, matrices? I mean, the number of elements, roughly. Um, Good question. I don't, I don't actually remember off the top of my head, but they're pretty big. If you really care, the precise benchmark I ran for this is in our software repository, and you can go check it out for yourself. But they're big. They're not small. They're, they're big enough to fill the machine, so they're not small. Question? Yes. From Ohio. Um, I noticed uh, you keep adding points to uh, your stencil, and if you keep adding that, eventually you end up with a dense matrix. Um, in that case, uh, the, that Laplacian operator is something that, for people like myself that do um, quantum mechanics simulations, it's a very important operator. And I'm interested in knowing if you have compared uh, your kernel with um, an implementation of matrix vector based on Fourier transform, because the Laplacian is diagonal in Fourier space. No, I have never compared it to anything that did a Fourier transform. And we're, we're very far from the dense case. Uh, you know, there are, as I said, there are 27 non-zero entries here, and there are millions of rows, okay. if Certainly I recall at some correctly. Point, at some point, if you keep adding elements, you will end up with a matrix that is dense enough that uh, Fourier transform will, would certainly be the best way of doing that, that matrix vector <sighs> operation. Possibly, for some cases, but we're very far from that regime. OK, thanks. And, and, and remember, we're not writing a kernel for Laplacians. We're writing a kernel for stencils. So the Fourier transform methods are, I mean, specific to certain PDUs. Right? But it's a good point. Uh, it's a good example of the overall point I was making earlier, which is you should take advantage of what you know about the data. So if you know the data you have is largely dense and you could apply a Fourier method and you think that might be better, then you should do that using a generic technique for something very specific is not necessarily a good idea. OK, so that's the structured case. This is the unstructured case. Um, the various columns here are different matrices that come from various kinds of problems. The one on the left is actually a completely dense matrix in sparse format. Uh, you'll see various finite element method things, uh, matrix from QCD. Uh, the ones at the right, like circuit and web base, they're a little bit more like a power law kind of construction. So we can see a few things here. First of all, the, the hybrid kernel is generally the best one, although not always. So for instance, in the dense case, where we have large rows that are completely regular, the vectorized CSR kernel happens to be best. The other thing you'll notice is that the one at the right, which has fairly crazy row length distributions, the, the more regular kernels like hybrid uh, and CSR, so vector CSR, their, their performance drops quite a bit, down to the level, in fact, of the, the coordinate format. Whereas the coordinate format is much less sensitive to the row length distribution. It varies a bit. It's not invariant. But it's fairly steady in this 4 to 6 gigaflop range. And the scalar CSR is pretty bad on most matrices compared to almost all of them. <laughs> and this is just the similar bandwidth plot, right? So on most of these matrices, we are actually getting a substantial fraction of peak bandwidth. The only ones where we're not are the ones that we have significant row imbalance 
we have to use the more expensive coordinate format to, to load balance better, and there we're only getting about 60 gigabytes per second. Not bad, but it's not 90% of peak bandwidth either. So is this diagram answering the earlier question about how the, the ELL or the hybrid kernel performs on power law networks? Because that web base at the right, I believe, is a power law network, more or less. I don't hear a no, so I'll assume yes. <laughs> um, and finally, you know, just to kind of calibrate your expectations, I wanted to show you how does this compare to CPU performance. One of the reasons I started doing this work in the first place is that a lot of people seem to have this attitude, which is a deeply flawed attitude, that because sparse matrix operations are irregular, they must be awful for GPUs, which can only possibly do regular dense linear algebra, which is, of course, completely false. Um, so what you see here is just the comparison of, of our GPU results with running uh, the in, Intel MKL on a fairly high-end Nehalem system on all the same matrices. And uh, as you can see, we actually perform quite well in comparison. And in fact, for many of these sparsity regimes, we uh, deliver much higher throughput. Fundamentally, the reason is this. On a per socket basis, this GPU is delivering substantially higher peak bandwidth than that Nehalem processor that we're comparing with. So if you can deliver a high percentage of peak bandwidth with your implementation on both, then the one with the high, higher peak bandwidth will obviously deliver higher throughput. And so the reason that you see here that the GPU actually delivers high performance in comparison to the Nehalem is that we are, in fact, able to achieve a fairly significant percentage of the peak bandwidth, which is much higher. Okay, so I alluded to a couple of times the fact that, that all this code is online, and so I just wanted to include a slide with the URL. We have a, a library that we call CUSP. It is our research vehicle for sparse matrix and graph methods. Uh, the little thing at the top is just a short snippet to show you what it takes to write a conjugate gradient solver with our library. Uh, so I, I think it's actually a pretty useful library if you just want to write iter uh, iterative solvers. But if you wanted to delve further into our performance benchmarks, all the code that performs those benchmarks is, is all in that repository. So you can go there and look at it. You can replicate my experiments and see if your numbers agree. If they don't agree, obviously I'd like to hear about it. OK, so that's all I wanted to talk about uh, on sparse matrix vector products, unless you uh, wanted to bring up anything else. This uh, Nihail uh, calculation, those are like a single thread? Single thread? If no, this is com no, this is completely multi-threaded. It's a quad-core Nehalem running on four threads and vectorized. I'm assuming Intel did a good job uh, of writing their kernels. I think they did. I should say, by the way, that if you're willing to do matrix-specific auto-tuning for things like per-matrix blocking factors, per-matrix row reordering, and so forth, you could, you could do both, you could do better on both platforms. What I'm showing here is uh, just, you know, not reordering, not doing any per matrix auto -tuning. Other questions? Yes, uh, NCSA has a question. Uh, in slide uh, number 30, I guess uh, that's, I noticed uh, a CSR performance bump. Uh, maybe you can explain that. Yeah, this one, uh, the epidemiology. All of them are. I think that there, there, there are a lot of rows with, that are very, very short, I believe, if I remember correctly. OK. So CSR scalar is actually perfect if the stride is one right, between threads. So if your row length is basically one or pretty close to one, it's actually reasonable. It's only when you have larger rows that it becomes bad. So in that particular one, the row, there are a lot of very short rows. Other questions? Yeah, question from Michigan. Uh, you have talked about uh, iterative methods, but uh, I'm interested in the matrix decomposition methods for sparse matrices. So where are we on that, like for single, single value decomposition or LU decomposition? Yes, so uh, sparse factorization methods are obviously harder than iterative solver methods. Um, there are a few different people who are working on 
uh, sparse factorization methods. But I would, I would still categorize all that work as in progress. But I would definitely expect within the coming year that you'll see uh, probably a handful of different sparse factorization solvers. And uh, what peak performance can we expect, like roughly, like in terms of uh, gigaflops? Don't know yet. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Sure. Can you comment on the potential difficulty that may come if people working on the dense factorization? You're asking why is dense factorization harder? Yeah. Uh, basically, the, the reason that dense fact or sparse factorization is harder is that as with the sparse matrix matrix product problem, you don't know what the sparsity pattern of the output it will be. You have to deal with all this fill-in that you're going to get when you do, say, your LU factorization. If you knew exactly what the sparsity pattern would be, it would be a lot easier. If you don't, then you, you need to do a lot of extra work to deal with the fact that you're going to fill in the matrix in some unknown way. So fundamentally, that's what's making it kind of tricky. You see it as a question. As a counterexample, if you were doing, um, if you were solving sparse tridiagonal systems, it's not nearly as hard <laughs> as general LU decomposition. Uh, I have it as a question. Yes. Uh, yes. Can you see that? Yes. Uh, first. Do I have a question? Uh, I want to know. So, is there any work on incomplete trilateral scale in incomplete LU factorization? Because in, in these cases, you can obtain this positive pattern since you are used to doing an approximation factorization. You're talking about uh, uh, preconditioning the iterative solver? Yeah. 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 Uh, that's actually something that we are, we're currently working on right now. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. So if, if we look at my little code sample, if, if you know about the numerical methods, right, this is an unpreconditioned conjugate gradient solver. And mostly, no one ever uses unpreconditioned conjugate gradient solvers. Right? They use some kind of preconditioner. Um, ILU and IC are pretty common choices. They're also pretty sequential choices. I think the interesting opportunities actually lie in figuring out what, what preconditioners are well suited to highly parallel problems, and of those, which actually make sense. Um, so there are some things we're pursuing, like uh, algebraic multigrid and sparse approximate inverse that I'm hoping will actually be pretty well suited and will ultimately behave a lot better than something like ILU. Can you you could thing? implement ILU or in incomplete Cholesky, but it's fairly sequential and you'd probably wind up implementing it a large chunk of it on the CPU. Uh, this is from UCLA. You mentioned the texture cache and L1 cache. Could you please explain the difference between those two? Are they both loaded in one clock cycle? Uh, well, neither of them is loaded in one clock cycle, actually. Um, the difference is uh, uh, the Fermi architecture, which I think David Kirk is going to talk about uh, in more detail tomorrow, introduces a cache hierarchy for loads and stores to DRAM. So if you issue a load instruction, uh, that data will actually pass up through the L2 and L1 caches, and it might still be there in the cache the next time you load the same address. So a fairly typical kind of uh, cache hierarchy on memory. The texture cache is quite different. Uh, it's designed originally for graphics problems, it's something that you give it an array of memory and you access it uh, with 1D or 2D um, addresses. And again, it's, it's a cache, but it's optimized for different kinds of access patterns because it's optimized for putting textures on polygons rather than just arbitrary memory references. Did I answer your question? 